You're listening to the Comic Crusaders Podcast. I am your host, Al Mega, CEO of Comic Crusaders and Undercover Capes. In this show, I'm sitting down with creators from all walks of life to talk about inspiration, process, the lessons they've learned, and a whole lot more. Wow, what up, me? This is your boy, Al Mega. Welcome to a brand new Comic Crusaders Podcast. And today we have an amazing guest. He works a little bit in TV and radio. He's a podcast host. But most importantly, because this is what we're about, he is an up-and-coming comic book writer that has a dope, dope project dropping from Image Comics. Today is the final order cutoff day. And folks, you're gonna after you see the images I'm going to show you today, that sneak peek, y'all are going to run and beg your LCSs for this book. Let me introduce the one, the only, the fearless one himself, Mr. Fred Kennedy. Wepa, how you doing? <laughs> That's a great intro. That's so good. I'm going to try and live up to it. I'm going to try. <laughs> yeah. You're the man, brother. You're the man. Thank you for coming on. I'll talk about this dope book you got dropping. It's the, it's the FOC today. I know you're excited. You're telling me in the agreement. You're like, oh, my God, today is the day. Don't you worry. It's going to be a sellout. <laughs> yeah. You know? I it's hope fire. so. I hope so. Yeah. It's. I oh. think it's good. <laughs> Well, wait till people see the artwork and then get a, a taste of the story from the wordsmith himself. So it's going to be fantastic. So as always, we need an origin story here because this is Comic Crusades. We need an origin. So Mr. Frick, tell us a bit about yourself, where you hail from originally and what was your first love in fandom? Um, you know what? It's funny when I because I moved to Canada from Belgium when I was 12 Um but, but like we had AFN, which is the Armed Forces Network. Anybody that was a base brat kid that lived overseas has watched the Armed Forces Network. And so you got a lot of like American television and all that stuff. And I can remember um, it was in the summer and I was in the fourth grade. And that was the very first time that I watched Star Wars. And it was Star Wars was really the first one for me. And I know that is kind of a cliche <laughs> answer. But I remember having big fandoms for things before that, but nothing on that level. Like Big Trouble in Little China was a huge movie for me as a kid. Oh, I love loved that show. movie a whole bunch. And I going to see Willow in the movie theater was I, I was super stoked about seeing Willow. But when Star Wars happened, nothing came close to that. It was like a whole new world. It was a big deal for me. And, and I remember we we were watching the all three of them were broadcast the same night, and then when it was return of the jedi i wanted to see what vader looked like under his helmet so bad and i knew they were about to take the helmet off and my dad changed it i was like change it back you gotta change it back <laughs> no. I, I remember that moment specifically it was a big deal at the time so yes it was star wars changed everything for me man that was the first day fred was about to confront his dad and he he, he reached the first date of fearlessness there dad yeah. how dare you looking <laughs> yeah. up <laughs> how dare you sir yeah <laughs> i'm digging it, i'm digging it so were you alone in your fandom growing up no i had some friends because like the thing was is that there was there was only like three english channels that you could watch and afn and bbc and all that and so all of our friends we would all like kind of talk about what shows were gonna come on when and we would get excited because this is like pre-internet this is the 80s and so <laughs> you would get excited about when a movie was going to come on TV like the week before because you knew about it because of the commercials. And then you would all talk to your friends. And then if you didn't watch it going to school, you'd get not ostracized, but you wouldn't be able to partake in all those discussions, you know? So you needed to make sure that you watched it. And there was my friend, uh, David Belanger was a big Star Wars guy. And my friend, Brian Dugan, who I'm still really good friends with today. He just happened to move to the same part of Canada that I did when he came here. So him and I are still really good friends, and he was a big Star Wars guy too. So I wasn't alone in my fandom. Okay, at the very least, at the very least. So when did you start getting interested in doing something with, with, with fandom or entertainment in general? One of that little, you know. You know, awesome. it's it's weird. I was thinking about this the other day because I always wanted to write and I always wanted to tell stories, but it's it's terrifying to do. Because what do you do? Do you write just to tell a story for yourself? Or do you feel like you're wasting your time to do that? You write a story that will be cool and popular. And I 
I loved Conan the Barbarian comics, and I would always want to write a Conan the Barbarian kind of story. But the first thing I ever wrote was this weird, quirky biography of a fictitious cross-country skier war hero from Norway that I thought was really funny and silly and really dry. Um, that was the first thing that I ever wrote in completion. But the first comic that I did was years after that. And it was with Adam Gorham, who's got that Darth Vader book coming out. He was the first guy I worked with. And how lucky is that, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah, right, you know? <laughs> how lucky is that? So we started working on this book called Teuton. And we did three... How did y'all meet, though? Oh, we met. So I moved all around the country working in radio and I moved to Toronto and I was on the radio and I was talking about Green Lantern. This remember like 12, 13 years ago when Green Lantern was like the biggest selling book going like before oh, the movie yeah. came out. But that year and I was on the air and I was talking about Green Lantern and I was saying how how stoked I am. The Green Lantern is super popular. Like Dude, my wedding ring is a Green Lantern ring. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was really nice. excited about that. And then he was listening and he wrote me an email saying, listen, I've got this book that I'm, I'm getting into shops. If you could talk about it, that'd be cool. And then I wrote back saying, dude, let's do a comic. And then he was like, okay. And then that was that. What? That was how, yeah, that was how it started because this is, it was like 12 years ago. And so we did this book. And we put out a trade paperback every year for three years and it oh. sold really well. Like it did really good for us, but it was an indie book. And then he went on to do the violent with Ed Brisson and I kept doing a lot of smaller press stuff. And I was doing a bunch of smaller press books and I was having fun writing and telling stories, but nothing was really landing with, like image and aftershock and dark horse and boom and oni and i was i was trying i really was trying it just nothing was clicking and uh so when you say you're trying th that's when you say you're trying you're just so folks don't even understand like when you say trying what, what are you doing were you pitching sending pitches. Conventions pi or pitching it well i because i work full time and i got a young family so traveling and going to the cons wasn't really in the cards it wasn't really an oh. option so I was sending, I would go to cons like two or three times a year, like local cons. And then I do one show, like I'd go to C2E2 and ECC and all yeah. that stuff. And I would meet people and then I would get emails and then I would send stuff and I get responses. Uh, and then they were responses like rejections. And then I kind of <laughs> was, yeah. So I kind of had kind of thrown in the towel a bit and I really just focused more on writing audio dramas and all that stuff. And then, I was actually at, it was, I was at New York con a few years ago and I had the idea for dead Romans and I was kind of batting the eye. And I remember specifically, it was on the flight home from New York. You know how you ever go to the con and then you leave and you're all amped up creatively. Cause you see all these things. Mm -hmm. I talked to Vita. I was talking to Vita Ayala and she was at the black mask booth. And I was just talking to her about the creating of ideas and, she was so positive and supportive and being like, you got to get those stories off your chest. You got to get it out. You know, you got to get it out. And I was like, I do got to get it out. So <laughs> I started writing this story for dead Romans. And uh, it was, I, I worked on it for a few months, just coming up with the characters and the, and the setting and what I wanted to do with it. And then I was at a show in Toronto selling like, ash cans and small press stuff that I'd done myself. And I was a few tables down from Nick Marenkovich, who's our artist on dead Romans. And I saw this book that he was selling called uh, the Voyager. And I, it was like, this is perfect. This is the art. And I was intimidated because Nick's really good. <laughs> He's yeah. really good. <laughs> so I was intimidated to, as a guy who had never had any commercial success or big books to even, approach him with the idea but when i told him that you know you're gonna get to draw like it's almost like a horror book with like the dark foreboding storms and swamps and romans and germanic tribesmen and all that he's like i want to do this i love i've always wanted to do a book about romans and i was like 
well, okay, let's do it. And so <laughs> that was the beginning. And we just came up with the, like the, the settings and the visuals and all that stuff. And he was wrapping work on another book. And then we got really into doing the dead Romans. And um, I'm friends with Ed Brisson. And he always said, he goes, the book that you break in with usually won't be the book that you love. And so he goes, a book you love is usually your second or third book. He goes, so if this is a book you really love, maybe you should have it on the back burner as a follow-up. But I didn't have any other things to throw out first. So I was like, yeah. let's just get it out. Let's just go. Let's send it. And I sent it and I had I and I did something completely different than I'd ever done when I pitched before. Because I didn't send the pitch package first. I sent the art first. So I sent the actual, the, the pages. Because we had the first 10 or 12 pages of the story done. Okay. And I, I sent those. And then I, and it was like, I just went through every editor's contact that I had. And I go, <laughs> this book is beautiful. I have more if you want it. Just take a look. Because I didn't want to go through the whole motion of creating all these, like, tailored pitch packages just yeah, to get a no so i let's send it get, let's see yeah. who's interested you yeah were fishing totally so I, really fishing <laughs> and i sent i sent it out and then uh jim valentino at shadow line got back to us right away uh nice. and and I, I i got more response from this pitch than i'd gotten for anything else but it was jim valentino was so supportive and was so positive about it and he he was like he goes this book is going to be beautiful we're going to make it sing it's going to be amazing and i was like yes <laughs> let's do that yes let's do it go maestro go right <laughs> yes yes so then that was, and after that got going it was just he held our hands through the whole process it was amazing so and I mean, we, that's a legend too yeah uh, absolutely business so it was dope that's yeah really dope. and to have his like stamp of approval and everything we were doing was great and we have uh, our editor, Allison O'Toole, she she is always working with like Chip Zdarsky and with Marvel. She's done so many great books and she works with Andrew Wheeler as well. And she to have her not only believe in the book enough to work with us on it, but then to get her feedback. And she's so talented. And there was the way I she, she was very big on what do you want to convey emotionally with this scene? What are you trying and are you getting there? And so many times you have people in your life that will say no. And then she never said no. She said, it was always, how can we make it better? Like, it's good, but let's be better. Let's, let's make it sing. I think that was her, not Jim that said, make it sing. She was, <laughs> and she's, she, she made me feel confident in what I was doing. And I'm, I'm, I've always said, like, if you look at my social feed, I've been very big on saying, I wrote it, but I'm just part of the team and I have a phenomenal team. Uh, and I, I cannot stress enough. Like Jose's colors are just absolutely amazing. Uh, Andrew's letters, like everything. I am so lucky to be part of this, this team that did that's Adam's cover, by the way, Adam Gorman yeah, did start, that cover. <laughs> yeah. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Let's start looking at this. You, you're praising <laughs> yeah. this team. Let's see what this beautiful book looks like by this amazing team it's, that's the adam Gorm. look at that cover though nasty it's so good so good nasty and so then we, we ha have yeah <laughs> so if you look at this cover this is something that i'm not, maybe not even supposed to talk about it but if you look so they always have the the, the chin strap that comes down but yeah. we put a human jawbone hanging from the side of the helmet instead and Ooh. it's just it's like <laughs> The, all of the things with Nick's art run deep. So if you look at the art, the image, it punches you. It hits you big, but there's always more to see in behind it. Nick is very meticulous with his art. So I am I remember he sent me this. He's like, I've got a great idea for a cover. I'm like, what is it? He goes, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to send it to you. I'm like, okay, let's see it <laughs> for sure. Absolutely. This is fine. There's a tattoo right here. Yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah, that 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 looks crazy though. If I see some homie coming down the hood like that, <laughs> yeah. you ain't seeing me. <laughs> yeah. So the antlers are like play a big role in the story. If you take a look at the imagery of the story, there's a lot of deer antlers and totemic symbology, and the 
the antlers because the main character, Arminius, his tribe are the Shirutsi. And the Shirutsi is a, like a Germanic word for heart, like a, like a, a stag, a deer. And so you'll see a lot of reindeer and stag symbols throughout the, the course of the story because it, it's the heart that uh, ate the, the bark and the leaves from the tree of knowledge. And so there's a lot of levels that we tried to work on. And I was really big. Like antlers look rad. Like they look really yeah. cool. But there's a lot more to it than just that. And we, we tried to include as much as we could because we didn't want to have just a story that looks good, but there's nothing to it. We want it to be good looking with a lot of depth. Yeah. Oh, oh God. This is that's gorgeous. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. That's crack right here. That's crack on this cover. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's a Who cover. For, it, that is Honoria. She is, her and Arminius are like the main protagonists. And uh, she is Frumentarii, who are like, uh, Roman assassins, spies, intelligence gatherers. Because one thing that you'll see consistently in stories and histories about Rome is all of the nobility would have their own agents out there working for them because they were working for Rome, but they were working for themselves at the same time. They're so everyone, Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so she is Frumentarii and I don't want to get into everything that goes on with her because you'll see it in the story. But in front of her, uh, right at the very front, is a character called Regulus, who you meet in issue two. And behind him is a Gallic cavalry officer named Epo, who you also meet in issue two that Nick drew to look just like me. So, <laughs> and I didn't ask him to do that. But he said, he goes, oh, he's like, man. You have that look, so I'm gonna put it, make him look similar to you. And he's like, "I'm drawing you with crazy hair." I'm like, "Okay, draw me with crazy hair." If that's what now you, you know who to appear as at the mm -hmm. next convention. <laughs> yeah. If if listen, if if it gets picked up as a TV series, I'm auditioning. I'm gonna go for the role myself. <laughs> like, how could you say that's not me? It's me. Yeah, it's me. You know? I am that guy. <laughs> Literally. And then they'll uh, find somebody who's like six feet tall, and I'll be like, "Ah, oh, I'm not tall enough for the role." <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no, no, you ain't. We ain't giving you that Tom Cruise type of tactics where we're gonna put <laughs> yeah. you on step stools and deny it. All right. Yeah. Um, no. So, man, you were digging deep into Roman history there, huh? Yeah. Well, because like I said, that I I grew up in Belgium and we lived uh, close to a, a, a settlement, a Belgii settlement, like one of the tribes uh, from Belgium that went to war with Rome. And I remember as a kid we went to this like archeological dig site and they showed us this recreated village and there it was by a Roman settlement. And then that's what kind of got me reading Asterix and Obelisk comics when I was a kid. Oh, cool. That which, was stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and Belgium has this huge like comic book heritage with like Tintin and the Smurfs and Lucky Luke and all that stuff. And so yeah, yeah. reading those Asterix comics, like, and I I've said this before, like you think, like as as adults, we kind of like poo poo on on silly little kid stories like that. But you never know what that's going to trigger in a kid's head. Like I know that there's a lot of things I'm interested in because of those childhood interests. And Asterix and Obelisk may seem kind of silly, but it sparked something for me to be interested in ancient history and antiquity and all that stuff. And it's cool. And what's wild is in Spain, the number one selling comic. For decades, is the story about this Lusitanian general who went to war with Rome, and you know it's. I'm I'm kind of hoping it does it does big in Spain. I'd love to go to I'd love to go to a con. It's such a good comic scene there. Make uh, it happen. Let's make manifest, yes. bro. It's yeah, going manifest. to happen. I gotta go there. I gotta go there. I gotta make it make it happen and put my book next to it. You know that's. Hey, the listen, uh, Arnold said you ain't famous unless you make it internationally. So let's yes. go, España. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm digging it. Look at that. And oof. Oof. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. Like that's getting pages from Nick is always so great. All yeah. of his stuff. And he'll, and it's, it's funny because he's always wrapping stuff at like one or two in the morning. And I'll wake up and it'll be the first thing I see on my phone. I'm like, yes, it's going to be a great <laughs> day today. Thank you so much. 
I'm digging it because I'm also like you mentioned Conan prior. I'm I'm a huge Conan guy. So yeah. Seeing this, I'm I'm digging this art like big time. Look at this. Holy smoke! What? Yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. That's brutal, son. So if you look closely, like he's not wearing any clothes, and that's something that we were adamant about. The so berserkers. Everybody knows about berserkers with with Viking history, but berserkers were around for hundreds and hundreds of years and the the mushrooms that they would eat they would they don't know whether they ate them or they made a tea or anything so i'm gonna i'm gonna be very graphic here <laughs> the mushrooms also caused them to have erections so this idea we had with all these like barbarians <laughs> running out of the woods naked and boned up and we had to ask we had to ask if we were allowed to do that and so there's going to be pages where that's going to happen. I'm just warning everybody. We want to be as accurate as we can because think about this. I want you to have that vision in your head. You're in <laughs> I don't want to have that vision in my head. I'm running for my life. Exactly. I'm running for my life. What the that's fuck? Terrifying. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yo. So, Man, what? And I'll be holding my ass, too. Like, holy shit. Just in case. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. Yeah. <laughs> so that, like. So they're all coming out of the woods and they're like naked, covered in blood and like wielding wood? weapons and stuff. Oh man, yeah. that sounds crazy. What what a pun right there. Coming out of the woods with wood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very wooded woods in these woods. Oh my god, yo. We would peck would have a ball. Hey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man, crazy. Oh, who this? Oh, that, this is that another is homie. Regulus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's regulus, yo. Yeah, so, dude. Yeah, Barry, he's uh he's Praetorian, so the Praetorians were like the hand picked, the best of the best, the guards of the guards. And so when you're talking about, like I mentioned the history of it, I wanted to make sure that everything clicked, right? Because the, the main guy who's the governor of Germania, whose name's uh, Publius Quintilius Varus, he actually served in legions and led legions in, in like Alexandria and then in Syria. And when the Romans were in these places, they would adopt, they would bring people in and then they would move. And so the backstory that we sort of give for Regulus is he joins the Roman army or rather is kind of like, you know, like forced into the Roman army when Varus is in Alexandria. And I don't want to give any, cause I really, really like his backstory because it all fits historically with what happens. Okay. And his story, like his backstory and Honoria's backstory were the ones that I put the most work into making sure they all added up in the timeline properly, given where everybody was supposed to be throughout the course of this story unfolding. But I really like his character because he's, he's like the exact opposite of me, like in the sense that He's unflinching and just does the right thing, accepting the consequences fully. Oh, okay. Like he's one of those guys who he is fully at peace with himself. So no he's sound what he wave does. and you're star scream. <laughs> yes, I'm totally star scream. Totally. I'm not as mis I'm not as deceptive though. I'm a bit more honest than star scream. But yeah. Oh, okay. He, yeah, he's sound wave for sure. Yo. Yeah. So this. Yeah. This is the Ooh, first the page I saw. Beautiful. Yeah. Really. Yeah, this is the first page I saw, which is the first page in the book, which this was originally going to be a cover, but we decided to make this page one to sort of establish the the landscape because I really loved uh, Becky Cloonan's run of Conan and every single mm -hmm. one of her Conan issues, if you look at the first page and she did it and maybe she did it just to get all of the, the business, like the credits and all that stuff on the credit page. But she is, she brings you in with the mood immediately of the first page. So this first page, this is it. They're alone in the storm and the crows are circling and it's all there. And you're just, you get the sense of them being totally at the mercy of the elements. And that's the, that's the premise of the book. So we are just, you know, dust in the wind we're at the victim we're the victim of the things that are going on around us that are beyond our control and mm. it's all really nicely presented on this page and nick has been so great to work with for really understanding that stuff because yeah this page oh, so, oh my god yeah 
Dude, so this that is, is so sick. This is the this is the this is pages two and three, and originally these were like just panels on the top of the page, but we blew it up, so this becomes the whole double spread, and the Penelope of War, like the big, mm-hmm. the because the thing is, is that the Battle of Tudorburg Forest, really, it's real, it happened, and you're talking about three full legions and their camp followers. A, a train of march like a column that's 20 kilometers long like that's like 10 miles long 10 15 miles long and it's just people marching as far as far as you can see it takes they start setting up camp and it takes hours for the back to even get to where they are it's a huge huge ordeal and we wanted <laughs> that grand scale like the big sweeping wide shots and so nick was perfect at that i was thinking today's generation would never walk that way yeah, yeah. <laughs> they freak out but yeah what, what a beautiful page man for real i mean all the detail in it it's like what what if bob ross drew, drew romans <laughs> yeah, yeah. look at all these happy little friends yeah yeah you know oh There's... wow dude yeah. look at this panel usage too holy yeah. smokes I told you, I'm so lucky to work with Nick. I really am lucky. And this is like our, this was the page when I said that I was, it was coming back from New York. This was the scene that I had in my head is this transition of her transitioning from now into like remembering the moment before the night before and going from the present to her memory. And it's just like that, the, the page like i know the the page has got some nudity at the panel with a bit of nudity on is what everyone draws to but it's that last panel that look on her face the way she looks up and then Mm -hmm. you've got like the sun flare i just oh i love it so much it's so end of the day is definitely all about the look yeah (laughs) so yeah definitely captured beautiful look beautiful Mm. and all the details that he puts into it oh don't want to ask what he was watching to get inspired yeah. by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wholesome stuff, man. Wholesome stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this uh, yeah, this is where it all sort of like hits the fan. This is where the story really starts to fly off. And you I really love the scene uh with with Honoria and with Arminius and when they're talking and um I did an interview a few years ago with Francis Manipal and he talked about how you need to make sure that when you're bringing the reader in those opening pages as, as much as possible are the Mac are a micro version of the macro story. And I really sincerely believe that if you pay attention to what happens in those opening eight or nine pages, all of the real true intent and the, the desperation that you see these characters go through all of that foundation is laid out pretty solidly right there because it's the most honest you see any of them be until the very end of the story. And I'm, I'm, I dude, I beat myself over the head writing those pages so many times to get the tone, right? Cause you know, when you're sending those pitch pages out, you, you want to show who the characters are and, I really feel like you don't know the characters, but you know what they want for sure. And all of the context really culminates as the story moves along. Like there's, we're, I know that it seems like a weird thing to say, but I think at its core, Dead Romans is a romance story more than anything else. I think it's a romance. It is, about the insane lengths that all of us will go to for that person that we love, you know, and you'll go through, you'll go through fire and brimstone and that's what we do, except instead of fire and brimstone, it's rain and swamps, <laughs> but yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> rain and swamps. So, you know, and nags here and there, you know? Yeah. Look life. Oh, oof, oof. Yeah. More. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look at this so much. And the in the page, I'm digging it. And again, the way it just yeah, your eyes just move along the page. Yeah. See, I that's can't the thing. see it with its word bubbles. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, when uh 
when people are writing pages and drawing it, laying everything out, artists love crowd scenes. They just love them so much. <laughs> so I, I put, I, I shouldn't have put as many crowd things as I did, but the thing with Nick was, is he wanted to have uh, lots, he goes, I want it to feel vibrant. He goes, and, and I know what I'm getting into. I'm drawing a lot. And there's going to be a lot happening on all the pages and it needs to feel frantic. Like you've got these guys coming out of the woods time and time again. And it's, <laughs> it becomes like, it becomes like a horror story. You never know when death is coming and you're surrounded in these woods and cut off and alone. And you can hear the screams. Cause you think about this, you've got this wagon train of kilometers of people the people at the front get attacked. The people at the back don't know what's going on. The people they get it all in, late. Yeah, they don't know what's <laughs> going on because there's no one can pick up a phone or anything. You're just marching. And then you stop and it's like, why are we stopped? And it's like, well, you know, a mile down the road, there's a, a bunch of guys attacking the wagon train. If the back gets attacked, the people at the front don't know. And there's an interesting thing where the Germans would take prisoners and they drag them into the woods and they kill them. Then they'd take their armor and they'd put it on and then they'd roll out of the swamps being like, oh, we were attacked. We're, we're Roman soldiers too. We were attacked. Mm. And then they go into the column and they march along and then they stir up havoc from inside the ranks. And you don't know who is a friend and who is a foe because it's there's that uh, in Andor, there's a great line in Andor. He goes, they're so proud of themselves. They don't think anyone will do it. And like, that is the premise is like, <laughs> there's lines where you get this sense of like, they really do believe that they are invincible, you know? Yeah. Oh, I love that splash. I love it so much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, talk about looking invincible. I mean, homie yeah. here. Look at that. <laughs> Holy yeah. smokes. Yeah, dude. I can't wait. This, this is definitely being added to my pool list. This is yes. something that's totally up my alley, man. Wow. Please do. I like as a Conan fan, it I because I really love that Carrie Nord run when he was with Dark Horse Crypto. Oh, yeah, Carrie man. Nord's run. I love Carrie Nord. We actually have a Carrie Nord cover for uh issue one, a variant from Carrie Nord, which was a big Carrie deal Nord, for me, man. Carrie Nord was the first print I actually ever bought. It was a Punisher print he had. He yeah. signed it for me, cool dude. It was just so <laughs> sick. I was like, I can't leave this here. It needs a home. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It needs a home, man. So he he's got a he did uh one of the Germanic characters, one of the German tribal leaders, like oh, sitting God. on horseback for a cover. It's pretty great, man. Oh, so yeah, I like, have to get that cover. <laughs> yeah. So these like this character, like because you got uh Arminius and he's talking to the dude who's got the shaved head and the beard is that's like his cousin, Hermeric, who's sort of like his Jiminy Cricket, like sort of he's falling off the rails. He's losing sight of the big goal. And he's very much, no, you got to stay the course. You can't let this falter right now. He goes, you've done so much. You just got to take it to the next step. And you could argue that he's almost a bad guy. But I believe that he is the character that understands more than anything what will happen if everything falls apart. I don't want to give anything really away because you can figure it all out <laughs> if you if you read the history about what happened. So, oh, nice. Okay, okay. And, and folks, see, we're gonna leave it there because before he starts spilling more, yeah, and giving it all away. I mean, look right here. You gotta follow the big homie on yeah. Twitter and at IG at Freelers underscore Fred, and he yeah. has a Facebook, but he said don't even pay attention to that Facebook. <laughs> yeah. You got to hit him up on Twitter, IG. <laughs> yeah, you can. You can follow me on Facebook and all that stuff too. But all the good stuff is going to be posted primarily on Twitter and Instagram. That's where I'm the most active with all my social stuff that I do. So talk to me about the plan here. How, how many issues deep are we going with this bad boy? Well, we got six. We got six okay. issues. That's like the – we're approved for six issues. Um, if we can do the next arc – I would love to do that. Initially, when I wrote it, I had all six issues and the execution was really dependent on getting that second arc. And we had to change it because we didn't know if we get it. So we changed the way we executed the opening because I didn't want to have this 
sort of like tease about a second arc and then we don't land it. So there's no yeah. payoff for it. But if we get that second arc, I have a really cool way of laying it out. And the layout of the story for the second arc is called Dead Germans. So it's it, it's that's the plan. If it if it pre-order, get as many copies as you can. Get so it can done. Do next, so we get the next arc. Because Nick and I are fully committed to doing a second arc if we can. If we get approved, we're 100% going to do it. I would okay. love to do the second second volume. See, we, we have to, brother. We have to. Because, you know, I know people are going to want to see that horrible scene <laughs> of, of, of the uh, crazy woodsman coming out of the woods. Cause it's gonna, I mean, that scene in my head already, I was like, oh, my God. I could see them really doing this in a movie. It's never yeah. going to end up... Man, you seeing this in a Roman movie like this? And that's the, oh, actually the opening scene. They, they, <laughs> they're, they, they, they're drinking their tea or, or ingesting it in whatever way they did. You know, they rip off their joint, come out screaming. You're like, what the hell's going on? And they're, they're, they're wooded up and just going on. I'm like, oh, my God. That, nah, bro. Don't, don't, don't play with me. So don't we me. The, the final issue is like a giant action sequence. The final issue. And I, the, I, I wanted to do something like, almost no need for any dialogue so when that when that whole like culmination happens we have an amazing five six combo the way issue five and six roll in together i'm really proud because i was looking at pages earlier today that are going to be out into the public within the next few months and the way he sets everything up is going to be great. Yes, I was I was doing that 100%. It's that good. I like I can't wait for you to see what's coming. Cuz there's some stuff cuz when I talked about them being in the woods and hearing the screams of everything that's all going on around them is you got to understand like we live in this world that is so bright. There's so much light going on, but you're talking about you're in the woods at night and it's not like the woods just like the park it's like the woods this is tudorberg forest this is a wood that is so dark and ancient that the romans didn't like being near it because they thought it was filled with evil spirits and <laughs> so the woods are dark and it's filled with swamps and you're stuck and you're hiding in like the mud and you can't see anything because it's overcast it's pouring and it's night and you're under the trees but you can hear screams, man. And you can hear the screams going on all around you because you've got tens of thousands of Germanic warriors from like 35 plus tribes that all hate each other, that have all shown up for one reason. We hate each other, but we hate Rome more. So they're all there. The only reason they're there, kill Romans. That's why they're there. And so if you're a Roman soldier and you're running, you don't know which way to go you're in the middle of a wood and you're just hiding in the mud waiting to die, getting eaten alive by bugs the whole time. Like it's horrible stuff. And I think that we, we, when we think about horror, there's like, there's so many different ways of looking at like, you got fantasy horror, you got body horror, you got like slasher horror. Like this is the horror of real life. Like this really happened. The horrors you, of war. Yeah. <laughs> And it, Why did we? Nobody would want to go back to those days. Let no, me tell you. no, no. Right now, like, everybody want to love it the way they shoot from afar, right? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 pretty pretty heinous stuff, man. Like when you look at what Rome did, and then what was done. It's the world was so so dark at that yeah. point. You know, it, it's the, the scale of the things that happened too. Like yeah. the the story of Tudorberg Forest, I think, is one of the most fascinating pages of history you can find man this guy's killing me i'm gonna have to start doing some deep dives now thank you mr kennedy you're giving thank me homework. you man I, yeah i haven't, ha yeah. haven't had homework in years so <laughs> yeah it's good it's good reading i i'm i, I talk to my kids about this stuff a lot too my youngest wow. thinks it's really cool and what's wild is he just oh. started reading that dark horse conan run he's nine yeah oh, he, i'm gonna love it. he's gonna love it that like like that first trade born on the battlefield where they show conan as the little kid as he grows up he thinks it's the raddest thing ever so he's getting really into it right now beautiful i got i got every dark horse issue and i am kind of trying to go back and get every single marvel issue 
Yeah. And I got my key. I got my keys. First Bellet, first Conan, Death of Bellet. You know, first Red Sonia. I got my keys. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a those big phone book omnibuses from like the '70s. Those oh, are great. Man. I got the Conan shelves in my office. Like I love Conan, man. That's the dream. I messaged Jim. I messaged Jim Zub about that, being like, "Listen, if you ever need anyone to help you out, just tap on my shoulder. I'm there. I'll be there right away." <laughs> uh, oh, I, I need to read some Fred Conan. We gotta make this happen. Too. Let's manifest mm. all these things. You know, manifest the, the, it. The, the the trip to Hispania. All right? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. This being a film, this being everything in the world, man. But first of all, the first thing you gotta do. Is there's got to be sell out at the shop, folks. So I need yeah, to, I, need, I need you to show this love right here. Dead Roman number one of six. That's a diamond order code. I made it easy for you. They probably have a lunar order code. I don't have it right now. I got the diamond one. Go to your LCS right now. Give them a buzz. All right. <laughs> Tell them yeah. you need this in your life. Trust yes. me. Well, you've seen the beautiful art. I mean, then we're going to see the word bubbles attached when it comes out. What, what, what's, what's the drop date? There it goes March 22nd, folks. March, March 22nd. 22nd. All right. Yes. Get that joint on your pull list. That's Fred Kennedy. That's Nick Marinkovich. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I got the name right. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got my name butchered. Let me tell you. All right. <laughs> yeah. But folks, yo, Fred, you've been an awesome guest. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate, you know, from a fan to a creator. Thank you. Thank you for being brave and bold enough to share in your vision and your stories with the world. That you know, I wish you nothing but success. And I hope to see you at a con and talking about that. Will like we where will we see you, if at all, this year? Um, I'm gonna be at uh the Toronto Comic Con in the spring, and I'm gonna be at San Diego, uh, and then I'm gonna go to the Fan Expo, the big Toronto show, the big show in Canada, uh nice. at the end of August, and then I'm going to New York Con. You cause you're like you're in New York, right? I did New York. Yeah, I'm in Massachusetts. I was in New York. I did New York oh. last year. But don't you worry. I'm planning on doing San Diego yeah, and then well, New York for sure. So we're going to chill. We are absolutely. Going to chill. We'll be don't there. Don't you worry. When you hear this, some loud guy saying, Whoop! <laughs> you guys, this Al's there. Yeah. He's down the aisle somewhere. Don't you worry. I'll be, Just yeah. Soon. I'm excited to go to New York and, and I'll be doing some signings at the Image Booth in San Diego and in New York. So. I'm really awesome. excited to be there. Yeah, it's, Wait, I'm, I'm gonna get my copy signed in person. It's gonna be fire. Personalized. <laughs> yeah, bro. Put put a big weapon. I don't know if Roman said that back in the day, but why not? <laughs> yeah, they will. <laughs> All right, man. Again, one more time, folks. Follow Fred on Twitter and IG at fearless underscore Fred. The links are below. Again, just final reminder, right? Final order cut off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That Roman's number one. Do it today. All right. I'm going to put yeah. the code on the bottom, too. Show that love. Fred, thank you again, mi gente. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Show the love. Hasta la próxima, mi gente. Wepa! Thank you for listening to the Comic Crusaders podcast. If you like the content, please subscribe and turn on notifications. Also, please visit ComicCrusaders.com and our extended podcast family over at UndercoverCapes.com. And also, make sure to download the Comic Crusaders app on the Google Play Store today.